So I got my booster a week ago and I posted on social media asking if I should do a follow-up video to my previous COVID video. And literally 100% of people who actually voted uh, said I should. So here we are. I'm going to talk about two things in this video specifically. Most of the things I've heard can be bundled up in what I'm talking, what I'm calling the adverse events category. This is the, if you get the injection, um, what kind of crazy side effect are you going to get down the road? So we'll talk about that a bit later, but first I'm going to talk about vaccine shedding. But even before I get into that, standard disclaimer as always, you're not going to change anyone's mind about this at this point. We're two years into this pandemic and uh, come on. But if you are interested in living in an evidence-based reality, welcome. And of course, as always, the links are in the description to check my work. And you should. Okay, so let's talk about vaccine shedding. Not to be confused with virus shedding, which means being contagious. Vaccine shedding essentially means that you are become contagious with something because you had a vaccine, which actually is plausible. Let me explain to you how this works. There's a certain group of vaccines called live attenuated vaccines. And what these vaccines are essentially is uh, vaccine makers take a virus uh, and they rough it up a little bit so it's not as potent. It isn't going to, going to harm you, but it's still the same structure and the same DNA as the virus so that your body can learn how to fight it and then fight it, and then you develop an immunity to whatever they're injecting you with. So the idea behind vaccine shedding is that while this virus is working its way through your body and while, you're, while your body is learning how to fight it, this weakened, uh, this attenuated virus is still running around your body and it's still, rep still replicating. And you can technically be contagious as a result of having had that, that particular vaccine. So here's some information from Emory University talking about live attenuated vaccines. And as you scroll down the page, you see here, these are basically kind of your big, like the live attenuated vaccine groups, right? Your MMR, your polio, smallpox, tuberculosis, that sort of thing. Live attenuated vaccination has been going on, documented in North America for hundreds of years now, um, and probably gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years before that on the other half of the planet. So here's the thing about these live attenuated vaccines. The benefits actually far outweigh any kind of risk. Hey Paul, how do you know the benefits outweigh the risks? I'm glad you asked. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know anyone who has polio? No? Now here's the thing about vaccine shedding. The odds of you actually being contagious as a result of getting the vaccine, it is technically possible but it's, the odds aren't very good. And here's a paper from the Journal of Infectious Diseases explaining that even in immunocompromised patients, vaccine shedding is actually rarely harmful. Now I say all that to say this, the reason this doesn't even apply to the COVID vaccine is because the COVID vaccine is not a live attenuated vaccine. With live attenuated vaccines, they put the vaccine in you, your body sees a foreign invader, has to figure out how to kill it, and then kill it, and then you have immunity. With the COVID, vi COVID vaccine, is an mRNA vaccine. So you're skipping the whole your body has to learn part because you're actually injecting the instructions on how to fight COVID right into you. So the vaccine shedding thing doesn't really work in the case of the COVID vaccine, but there we go. So let's talk about these adverse events for a second. So essentially when people get vaccinated, when there's any vaccination that happens, if there's any adverse event, um, it can get reported into a government reporting system so that we can track to see, okay, what's going on with these viruses that we didn't anticipate, that we didn't catch in clinical trials, that sort of thing. In Canada, all this stuff gets reported provincially and then gets bundled up federally into the Canadian Adverse Events Following Immunization Surveillance System, or CAFIS. And in the U.S., they use their Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. Now, I know that in Canada, or at least in British Columbia, there are actually certain things that we specifically look for when someone's given a certain type of vaccine. But one of the drawbacks of these systems is that if you have an adverse event following a vaccination, you go talk to your family care provider, and they then fill out the form and send it off to the government. Now, the problem is that correlation does not equal causation. For example, uh, after I got my booster last week, um, I was at home playing with a dog kneeling on the floor and our couch has a little pull-out section that has a little lip on the side and I was kneeling where that little lip was and I went to stand up and I banged my knee into that little lip really hard. Um, that was about a week ago and my, my knee still hurts. Now, was that caused by the vaccine or was it caused by me being a klutz? Correlation does not equal causation. But let me actually get into the details here. So somebody had said to me that one of the concerns they had was that um, in young people 
there were cases where people had heart problems after getting the vaccine. Now, the person who told me this didn't get into the details of what the heart problems were or, or how many there were or anything like that, uh, so I'm going to now. So what the heart problem was is it's actually heart inflammation. It's inflammation either of the heart muscle or inflammation of the area kind of surrounding the heart, um, known as myocarditis and pericarditis, respectively. So the question is, is there a way for us to kind of have some knowledge around whether or not the vaccine would cause these uh, conditions in people. One way we can check this out is to just look at the number. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a hard time saying is to just look at. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the hard numbers. So basically how this works is this. If the vaccines cause this heart inflammation, you would expect that people who you would expect a higher incidence of this heart inflammation among people who've been vaccinated compared to the incidence of people who have not been vaccinated or the incidence of these conditions before COVID was even a thing. If 10% of the population have pickles, you would expect 10% of the people who are vaccinated to also have pickles because 10% of people have pickles. So 10% of any subgroup of that people should also have pickles. The numbers will average out. So the question is, does the vaccine cause pickles? I hope not because pickles are gross. There's a take we can all rally around. <laughs> all right, so what we're gonna look at is how many people would we expect to normally have myocarditis and pericarditis? And how many people who have been vaccinated have myocarditis and pericarditis? If we see that among people who are vaccinated, that percentage is higher, then we can probably think in our heads, wait a second, yeah, it does seem like the vaccine causes these cases. If the number is the same or lower, then we could say, okay, it probably doesn't cause myocarditis or there are other factors, but either way, the vaccine isn't one of them. So this report here on the National Institutes of Health website actually talks about the global global incidence of a whole bunch of different diseases and conditions and that sort of thing. And in one of these many tables on the page, it talks about myocarditis. Again, the link is below if you want to check my work, but if you want to take my word for it, which you shouldn't, uh, in 2015, there were 2,693,100 cases of myocarditis reported globally. So since we're talking about global numbers, we need to know what the population of the planet it was in 2015. Fortunately, I was able to find this PDF file on the UN website and it shows us that in 2015, the world population was an estimated 7,349,472,000. Now over to my math spreadsheet. So I plugged some of these numbers in uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say what percentage of the global population had myocarditis in 2015. So we're gonna say this field equals that number divided by that number, and we end up with 0 0.0003. Let's, let's express this as a percent. That spreads out as a percent. All right, so 0.04% of the population would be expected on a, on a regular year, pulling a year out from random, uh, would be expected to have myocarditis. Let me show you where I got these numbers from though. So this page on the CDC website actually keeps a tally of how many people in the US have been vaccinated and how many doses have been given out and that sort of thing. Um, obviously this is a running total, but I had to go back to October 6, 2021 to find out how many people were vaccinated then. And I had to do that, I had to download the data in a spreadsheet and poke through it and figure out what was going on. You're welcome, quite frankly. But the reason I had to go back to that specific date is because on that date, the CDC put out this report saying that as of October 6, 2021, there were 3,336 reports of myocarditis and pericarditis in the US. So back to my math spreadsheet, as of October 6, 2021, according to the data I pulled from the CDC, 201,242,167 people had been vaccinated and there were 3,336 reported cases of myocarditis and pericarditis. So what percentage of the, of the US population is that? That divided by that equals, express it as a percent if you please. Uh, that's not what I want to see. Let's throw a few more zeros in there. There we go. Let's throw a few more zeros in there as well so they match up. So what this shows us is that there's actually considerably fewer. You would expect that there would be more cases of myocarditis or pericarditis or a combination of the two of them um, among vaccinated people. You'd expect there to be more. So I say all that to say this. Correlation does not equal causation. And again, we could talk about risk versus reward or whatever, but ultimately... The heart thing doesn't really pass muster in my view. Now, someone had also suggested that um, if you are a mother who is breastfeeding, your baby could have heart failure if you get the vaccine. 
Now, this paper from the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology suggests that uh, it actually benefits your baby if you are uh, pregnant or if you are breastfeeding uh, because you do pass some antibodies um, from the COVID vaccine into your baby. So it's actually going to help protect them. Now, what this paper doesn't talk about, of course, is how much does it protect them or how long does it protect them from. And it does say that it's not complete protection, um, but it does help. Now, one of the things we need to quickly review is sample size. The vaccines have been in the wild now for quite some time from, you know, start, the start of clinical trials through till today. Um, when I did my last video, there had been around 6.7 billion doses of the vaccine given out worldwide. As I record this on January 22nd, 2022, we now see there have been 9.7 billion vaccine doses administered worldwide. 9.7 billion. That's a very large number. So what that tells us is that if these vaccines were going to cause any major health issues or major outbreaks of something or major whatever, we would definitely know by now. So that is the two kind of main things I want to talk about. Uh, the vaccine shedding thing, again, the benefits far away the risks. And the adverse events thing, again, correlation does not equal causation. Uh, and we have to take these adverse event reports with a bit of a grain of salt because you can report something whether or not it's relevant. But again, even with these adverse events, you can look at the numbers themselves and kind of realize that, oh um, yeah, yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's just, maybe it doesn't really stand up as, as, maybe it's not really a great reason to not get vaccinated. Yeah, maybe it's not. Now, at the beginning of the video, I said, once again, you're not going to change anyone's mind about this. And I mentioned I was going to talk, about, talk a bit about that later words. This is the later. Now, I don't really think at this point with 9.7 billion doses out there in the wild with, I know for myself, having being two doses plus the booster, um, friends and family being vaccinated and boosted, the vaccine safety argument isn't really an argument anymore. I don't really, I, I'm, I'm not even entirely convinced that people are, are genuinely believe that the vaccines are unsafe at this point. But one thing that I haven't talked about is sociology. I think sociology has a lot to do with uh, anti-vaxxing. But that's just me. What do I know? Anyway, thanks again for watching. And ho hopefully we never have to have this conversation again, although we probably will. Uh, please stay safe once again. And um, feel free to ask follow-up questions as well. If, if someone presents you with um, a random claim of something, kind of ask them, hey, well, where'd you hear that? And where'd you get the information? And can you get more information about it? And see what they come up with. I think you'd be interested to see what um, they came up with if you actually push back on someone to say, you know, to back up their claims. Give it a shot. See how it goes. Let me know. Until next time, stay safe. Well, one way we can start to check that out is to just look at the... So one, one way we can check that out is to just... Oh, wow. One way we can check that out is just is <laughs> one way we. <laughs>